It is our goal to record a series of basic endodontic procedures that help you employ strategies that accomplish access to the pulp chamber, access to the canal orifices, create straight line access for both, shape canals without distortion, and to a dimension that adequately cleanses all the canal walls, be they round, oval, curved, or straight. This will be followed by simplified but highly effective means to obturate the canals in three dimensions with the ability to prepare immediate post holes when necessary. Finally, we will show you what, in our estimation, is the best way to restore endodontically treated teeth with posts and cores. Today, we made a short video that demonstrates one effective way to gain access to the pulp chamber and then find the orifices of the canals. In the process of opening pulp chambers, we may encounter wide open pulp chambers, severely calcified ones, some with large pulp stones, and others with aberrant anatomy. We have to be prepared for these situations and have a strategy that is both safe and effective. In that light, for each given topic, we may make several videos to better visualize the variety of situations that we may encounter. In this short video, I am going to show you one way to attain excellent access to the pulp chamber as well as cleaning the pulp chamber in a way that clearly shows the orifices leading to the canals. I've always been partial to the use of high-speed long shank round burrs. Typically, I'll use a number four round burr, but if the tooth is thin like a mandibular anterior, I'll use a number two round. There are occasions when retreating a molar with a cast post in it that it will take away the bulk of the metal using a number six round burr. In the example you see in this video, I am making my initial access with a number four round burr. As long as the occlusal surface of the tooth is not worn down, I can make a depth cut of 7 millimeters immediately into the pulp chamber. However, I prefer to gain the depth a little bit slower, creating the outline form for access in the process. As you can see, at just about the 7 millimeter level of depth, we hit the pulp chamber. Please note that the 7 millimeter corresponds to the end of the taper on the round burr, regardless of its size. Lining up the end of the taper with one of the intact cusps is a good way to assure accurate depth. To go 3 millimeters beyond the point leads to a higher incidence of perforation through the floor of the chamber. Note, 3 millimeters offers a wide margin for error, but try not to take advantage of it. Once the pulp chamber is reached, your next goal is to remove the entire roofing of the pulp chamber without removing excessive tooth structure. Some are of the opinion that a number two or four round burr has too big a head to minimize the amount of tooth structure removed, that it will gouge out excessive dentin, undermining the coronal dentin. However, once the proper depth is made, the lateral cutting sides of a round burr can be used with a light brushing stroke, making the coronal opening no greater than is needed. Here you see the floor of the chamber. Please note its distinct darker color compared to the lighter circumferential dentin. The orifices of the canal are to be found along this border, generally at the apices of either a triangle or square that is formed on the floor. I probe the light, dark, dentin border with a sharp explorer looking for signs of orifices that are the initial openings into the canals. The pulp chamber of this particular maxillary molar is quite calcified and prevented me from gaining access to any of the canals. Consequently, using a light brushing stroke, I remove more coronal dentin, particularly along the light, dark dentin border. At this greater depth, I was able to find the canals and entered them with an 08K reamer. I negotiated the length of the canals using a watch winding motion coupled to an in-out stroke. Please note my hand motion as I negotiate the reamers to the apex. I never use excessive apical pressure. This would just buckle the instruments without aiding in the negotiation of length. Once the three canals were found, I started to negotiate the MB2. Please note that this canal is quite narrow and required a fair amount of time to negotiate full length. At times, you may hit a wall which is detected quite easily. Under these circumstances, you would place a 45-degree bend in the last millimeter of the instrument and then using a light peck and twist motion, attempt to find the pathway around the blockage. Please note its negotiation to full length. Examination of the instrument used manually shows some minor unwinding. 
Unlike rotary eye tie, these stainless steel reamers used with a tight watch winding stroke are in no danger of separating in the canal and can still be used without replacement. Here you can clearly see penetration into MB2. Once the depth has been reached with the O8, unless there is an abrupt curve that must be negotiated manually, the reamer is placed in the reciprocating handpiece at approximately 3,000 to 4,000 cycles per minute, and within seconds length is reached. Generally, a maximum of three to four strokes are necessary to reach the apex with minimum apical pressure applied. We are now negotiating to length in the Dista Buckle Canal using the number 10 reamer in the reciprocating handpiece. After shaping the canals to a 10, we then take the first relieved reamer and use it in the reciprocating handpiece as seen in the video. Again, please note how easily progress to the apex is generally made. Once the canals are open to a 20, we widen and straighten the coronal aspects of each canal using the tapered piezo. Please note how clear the access is now to the rest of the canal. Compare this opening to the MB2 next to it. In the process of shaping, all the canals are straightened and widened coronally with the tapered piezo always used primarily against the outer wall of the canal.